Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Crypto 10X. It's Barnaby Anderson, your co-host. And today I'm with Sergio Martel. We brought hey. you back again. Hey. <laughs> and today we're going to do a crazy deep dive into the open sea phishing attack. It wasn't exactly a hack, but it was a phishing attack that just happened. So let's get into it. <laughs> Sergio, what did you, um, I actually, I alerted you to it on Saturday night and uh, it, it happened within 24 hours of the email going out from OpenSea telling everybody to migrate to the new smart contract for all sales. So everybody who was selling any NFT on OpenSea had to migrate to their new contract. And then weirdly enough, a phishing attack coincided exactly within 24 hours of that happening. Yes. What do you think? What do you think? Yes, I, I actually was on the OpenSea uh, homepage and you had this banner that was kind of changing color saying, oh, migrate your listings to the new. And I did click on it. Ah. <laughs> and that's why I got really scared. I said, okay, the, what did I do? <laughs> this is the email. This is the email that came through. Yes. And uh, I, I got the email because I did have some things for sale up on OpenSea. And it came, and it, you know, it's a legit, it came from um, team at OpenSea.io and it directs you over to the, to the real OpenSea website, but you didn't get this one. I did not because I don't have listings in OpenSea. So I regularly just wait for people to ask to buy. <laughs> huh? So how did you how did you know this was all going on? How did you know? Well, you sent me the you sent me the link. You were the yeah, one yeah. that you alerted. Yeah, but how did you know about the migration happening? How did well, you... the thing is, I already knew around that, and I sent you the contract as well. That the Wyvern. So there's now going to be a new smart contract that is going to be running OpenSea. And for the first time, they're actually sharing the code for that contract because before it was completely obfuscated. <laughs> Basically, because of the the banned NFTs uh, new marketplace that we're building, that you've been doing, you've been building this out, and you did tell me a week beforehand, oh, that OpenSea is releasing this code, and you were, we were excited because we could start to see more on the inside. Because while we are building upon wearables contract, the OpenSea yes. stuff is still interesting so you were across that a change was happening yes i knew that a change was happening and you know with those changes you do need to migrate uh, the listings or anything any interactions that you had with the old contracts you need to have like a migration towards the new ones so i was uh, since i was kind of just doing like research as well in open sea i was there and i saw this banner and i clicked on yes migrate even though i didn't have any listings um and then we kind of went down the rabbit hole about all the stuff that was going on <laughs> and the massive amounts of money that were siphoned off. I think it's value versus money, no? because I think at the end, the hacker went away with like $2.7 million. Uh, but I think the value that was lost was closer to 200 to 300 million, you know, because he, he basically uh, sold at bargain uh, at basement bargain base uh, basement bargain oh, prices. <laughs> that's why I couldn't understand. So you're saying it was actually two hundred million dollars of value, but value. he sold it. But he only took like one percent of it because he sold it yes. so fast. Yes, yes. And anybody, I mean, how do we basically? How, how do we know all this? Because it's on chain. It's yes. actually it's all up on EtherScan, as you can see here. This this even says warning. There are reports that this address was used in, used in a phishing scam. This is the wallet. And it's been drained. It's back down to only like $8,000 worth of value. Uh, but on the weekend, when this was happening on Saturday in real time, as we were watching it, like, look at this. This is the last two days, five hours ago. So mm -hmm. they wrapped it up, but they pumped it. And there's, uh, if we click on the view all, this is all, all, the, uh, all the transactions, there's 11 pages of NFTs that they, they siphoned this phishing attack. But how about we go into well, what does that even mean? Did did they comp was OpenSea's smart contract compromised? No. So no, no, it wasn't. I mean, it's still kind of, it's still very. There's something weird because all right. So let's first explain what a phishing attack is. A phishing attack is a social engineering attack by which you send the illusion that you're receiving a communication from one company to intercept the traffic and then 
you take the data. So you would receive, let's say, an email from Amazon saying, hey, you know, your, your account has been compromised. Please change your passwords. And you click on a link and it takes you to a website that looks just like, uh, uh, like Amazon's. And then you put in your old passwords and then you put in your new password and they're only really caring about the old password. Uh, and then they use that to, to log in and, and do whatever with your account. So it appears that it's something similar happened in this case where since OpenSea naively sent out all of these emails saying, you know, migrate your, uh, uh, your listings to people who, uh, who had listings on OpenSea, then people just clicked on it and then went and signed a transaction. And we'll get into, I think, what we can take away from these actions. And I, I do believe that there is, I mean, I don't think, there, there, so again, as you said before, it wasn't open C smart contracts that were uh, that were hacked or that were vulnerable that had security issues. I think it's their practices that make their overall ecosystem very fragile. So yeah, you just used the word naive. Uh, are we being a bit kind with them, saying that they were being a bit naive with this? Uh, oh, I saw this beautiful meme that it was like you know a whole bunch of like eight year olds, you know, tweens around the table with a pizza, and, and they're saying Open Seas discussing security. <laughs> oh my goodness! I mean, this is a, a this is an extremely young company that has taken on the burden of being the backbone of the NFT marketplace. I mean, it, it is so important what that they what they do that is really it's massive, and I don't believe that they have the the let's say the the combined experience. It's in, I don't know the people in OpenSea, but I, at least from the design decisions that they've made and the way that they have handled things, I think they're in need for like an experienced kind of like old school <laughs> engineer. I get it because what you're saying is this is pointing, this is showing their vulnerability. And let's just go through what must have happened. So they've been planning this migration, no doubt, for months. I would say at least three months. They must have been even longer planning this migration, doing the smart contract, getting it audited, doing the whole thing. And then they then they sent out the email. So in the background, I'm not sure how much of the community knew that that was going to happen. But um, basically, they push out the email on the Friday. I got it. Hundreds of thousands of other people got it. But then, co coincidentally, not really, within 24 hours, the phishing attack happens. So there's a couple of key points there, which as you and I have discussed, one is um, how would that person have known? Because they had a lot of prep. They would have prepped all the, their own smart contract, everything that they built. They built this incredible little mini infrastructure in smart contracts that connect up to a phishing fake email address that goes over to, to siphon people away. But they did it on exactly the right timing. And they did it to people's email addresses who were users of OpenSea. So they had this database of people's email addresses they knew exactly the timing and they'd already prepped all their own smart contracts to steal everybody's, um, these, these hundreds or thousands. I mean, there are even bored apes in here that are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yes. They, so there was somebody for at least a month, probably. Now, how could that happen? Yeah, I think there's two ways that this could happen. I mean, normally almost all of the, I mean, the weakest link in any security, it's always the wetware. It's always the human. <laughs> so there. Uh, there, there's two ways that I fathom that this could have happened. So one of them is a targeted kind of attack. So that means that you're following the people that you want. I mean, the people that, that get, got attacked most probably know the attacker, no? Somebody that knows their email, that knows that with their holdings, and then they were able to pull this off. So it's someone close to them that did it. Ah, that, I mean, I, I don't think that's very feasible because of the amount of people that got hacked, you know, so I think it's more than 300 people that uh, that were you know, that, that actually got this. So the other thing is, all right, well, they got access to an email uh, to an email list or an email database that comes from OpenSea, because I mean, you still have to figure out that who were the people that have that are on OpenSea, which is a very small percentage of the overall web. And then those people that actually have valuable uh, assets, no? So, I mean, we don't know how many of these emails were sent. We can maybe know how many people clicked on them because if you do kind of the forensics on the, uh, on the blockchain, but yeah, I think this is something that came internally as well. That some so we do they know must that... have gotten user. They, we, know, we know that 
the attacker had the user the user's email. We know that. And we also know that a few months ago, one of their staff members were front running. They knew every listing that was going to happen before it was going to happen. And they got to buy up some of those NFTs and then sell them at the peak. That was definitely, and that person I think is, well, they've lost their job. They've been prosecuted, et cetera. I think that's happened. So that, so they've already had one case and now it's just mysterious. It's not clear. However, what is very sad, I mean, uh, this particular, how could we look at, this is, an, this is one of the board apes that was uh, stolen, um, 8911. How could we find out the the value of that? That's that's tragic. I mean, buying somebody buying this, and and even what is the uh, did isn't is OpenSea doing a refund, or how could they even do any kind of like? The, the thing is, OpenSea is really not at fault. Let's say, no. So I think uh, at the end, it wasn't their systems that were compromised. It was their naive communications that were uh, that were that were hit. No. So look, this one here, look at this. Yeah. This this one was stolen, and it yes. says reported for suspicious activity, eighty nine eleven. So so basically, and it, um, its all time average price was. And that's the other thing, which is um, I think the 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 reality behind NFTs and the reality behind the blockchain, which is now this ape is blacklisted. No, so. Here you see it's been there's been several transfers there, kind of from oh, in the last people. couple of look at that. It all it was all fine six months ago. Yeah. And its last sale there was 25 ETH. Mm -hmm. When when ETH was uh four thousand dollars, that could have been yep. so that's like um a hundred thousand dollar NFT. Yeah, yes, exactly. And then suddenly three three transactions in the last three days. Yes. And then and then the problem is, is that as you see from the top, it is now blacklisted. So no one's going to want to buy that. And then the other thing, which is we still don't know what's going to happen, is is the Board of Yacht Club going to honor? I get look at this. Buying and selling of this item has been has been disabled on OpenSea. So let's jump over onto Rarible. I mean, this is just yes. kind of I'm just doing this in real time. Like let's uh, let's see. I'll oh, look at that. Okay, I have to sign in. So that that's oh, so open. This is also um, interesting. We're going to talk about that in a minute as well. This this forced. Um, Signing, signing a transaction um, <laughs> board apes let's have a look and see where's the collection board, no, ape. The board ape you have to say oh, board ape. ape. yeah there it is that must be there it, it is. Is. yeah so then if we go looking um for is there a search functionality here uh, there, there should be if you i think it was 89 11 we can that should be your results Hmm. This is uh, it's not as easy to find things as it is on. Oh, think so. Here, just click on just click on on on, on any board ape. Just click on any board okay. ape. Just click on that. And then look on the on the top. You see no no no. Just so here that's twenty six sixty five. Just on the URL, you see yep. that. Just change that that URL. Ah, just the you just change here. that. Yeah, and all the way to the and yeah. Like this? Yeah, like that. Because yeah, that's the one. Okay, so yeah. oh my goodness, this is uh, is yeah. this this is still for that, sale? That's still for sale. But that's all right. So you see, OpenSea says, okay, you can't sell this one anymore. I mean, you can still do it through Rarible. You probably can do it through Looks Rare, but that token is always going to be stigmatized as being kind of black market, no? So that again kind of gives you the question, okay, how valuable is this token now? And then there's the other question, which is, is the Board of Yacht Club going to just turn a blind, a blind eye to this and say, well, yeah, you lost it. I mean, the token is still going to have uh, you know, all the rights that we give to regular holders, or is the Board of Yacht Club going to say, hey, well, you got this and this is stolen property, then you have no rights. Totally. I mean, like, I don't even know how many, just on this number, on this first page out of the 11 on Etherscan, there's already one, there's already three board apes, mm -hmm. maybe yeah. averaging 50 to a hundred thousand dollars each Yes, that were, that, that had been, and that, that's only on the first page. So for all I know, there, there could be, uh, I don't know, 10 or, or 20 board apes. I'm not sure the numbers, but anybody can go check this when you just go through the Etherscan on this compromised wallet. And you're making the point like, well, well what is the board ape community going to do about this couple of dozen if that's how many 
yeah, and then and then it really comes. I mean, all right, it's the whole PFP thing, and the whole almost the whole NFT market is really built on top of uh, of no, unwritten rules, an ethos. You no, know? so if you don't own an ape, you're not going to use it as your profile picture. But no one is stopping you <laughs> from using it as a profile picture. You may get caught and burn your your wallet because hey, this is not your ape or whatever. But no one's stopping you to do it. So it's let's say there it's it's a civic type of uh, of duty for you to not use somebody else's ape as your profile picture no well now that we're getting into this field where you're actually i mean you are the owner but it's stolen property will the community what will the community do will these tokens that get stolen just be you know like token non grata <laughs> be pushed away from the community because that's basically what gives value to these things so yeah, that's a big question. I mean, this is going to be something that is going to be substantial for the uh, for NFTs and and their future. Uh, it is. I mean, like this is a I mean, this this particular stolen uh, ape. Um, so that that's this. Is there any history? I'm just checking to see. So that somebody's putting a. They, look at this. People know. People know that this because they're putting yeah. these really low offers in uh, yeah. in wrapped ETH and. Uh, so it is fascinating. And then, then there's this other crazy stuff. We've got a few other links here to, to look at, like this crazy uh, deep dive. This is actually one of the first articles I saw over here on um, Bowtie, Bowtie Island. Yeah, okay. And there's this article that goes into the all these details on the on the hack that as it was happening, it's, oh, that, that's where we got that's this. That's where. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, OpenSea hack is bad. This guy tornadoed into a fresh wallet, 12 slash 30 made a weird contract call on the 22nd of January open sea contract ether scan down of course and now he's pulled 18 batches of nfts so i mean there is an exploit on open seas contract so he had to do this through open seas contract it appears no okay so i don't even this is this is super detailed these are all the wallets of how it was moved this is the hacker yep and all the different this is a a pretty serious operation Yep. And as you said, like, you know, he pulled out at least uh, 2 million in, you know, after he sold everything. Money, yeah. In 24 hours, yeah? Yeah, yeah a couple of hours. A couple of hours. And, yeah. And then he tornadoed. So I don't know if uh, uh, maybe we should explain what tornado uh, cash is. Uh, and this is a system that allows you to put in money and then they just kind of like do a lot of microtransactions and then money comes in kind of dirty, money comes out clean. <laughs> you can't you can't it does it, it sort of blocks the tracking even though because everything's visible uh on the on the blockchain but if you mash all these transactions up together in like a washing machine it sort of spits them out and, it, and you can't actually easily or yeah. if at all i'm not sure if you but that, that's you, a way you can you can but it's just just the amount of, uh, the, of the volume and transactions that all of these uh, yeah it just makes it unfeasible totally so there's yeah there's this article here that points to this uh detailed movement of all the transactions uh, then there was even other details over here on this is this is the, it explained in this thread. So Twitter's got a lot of information on this. I guess some of the people who, I mean, essentially some people might, might be running. Okay, so the long and the short of it is that OpenSea moved everybody to this new contract, which is now visible for all of us to read the code. It used to be obfuscated, so we couldn't see it before, and now they've made it. And and so and there's no problem as such with that contract, but there was this internal. I can't say internal, but there was this phishing attack that is quite curious that happened exactly lined up at that moment and now it's done it's over so it people's nfts are, are not at risk right now on open no. sea or wearable so it's not like there's some flaw that they're all going to just leave so anybody listening to this like don't worry that you're going to suddenly lose all of your nfts it's not about that it's like doing a deep dive into what are the processes going on and and inside of that how does it relate to people who you know when you've got your profile and how you sign up and, and what are your thoughts around this whole Web three versus Web two and signing up to and signing um, transactions on, on your yes. MetaMask wallet? So I think again, it wasn't an exploit on OpenSea security. It's an it's an exploit on OpenSea's poor decision design decisions. No, and here we have this uh, uh, this affordance, which is something that. You have on a, either a graphical interface or, a interface or in a user flow that makes a lot of people in Web three vulnerable. And so let's let's try to understand what 
kind of Web3 is kind of promising and how they're, I believe that they're being too adamant on saying we're going to leave behind the old ways and we're going to be completely new. And I, I believe that's the big kind of problem that we, that, that the reason why this hack happened is the fact that we're too loose in signing a transaction. <laughs> People are just so accustomed on saying, yes, sign it <laughs> because OpenSea makes it so that almost everything you have to do, even though it's not on chain, because that's a big thing. Any changes you do to this website, it's not on chain. It's on their central servers. The, the thing that you're kind of signing something on the, because it's going to have repercussions on the blockchain, that's just, that's, I mean, that's a lie. <laughs> because you're not going to store strings. You're not going to store your bio. You're not going to store any of the stuff that, you, that you're going to change in your settings. You're, gonna, you're not going to store it on chain. You're storing it in their private server. No? But they're making the solution, oh, yes, we're completely decentralized. So sign, no? sign a transaction. Sign something. No? And that is just wrong. The Hang on, only... let's, let's, let's just break it down. So we're, yes. we're, those of us who are doing crypto, I presume everybody listening is, we're always signing stuff. When we do a transaction, we're signing. But when we also first log in and connect to a website, we're also just connecting. And usually there's one little checkbox. If it's, a, if it's an okay website saying just, just checking your address, what's public on. So there's no problem with doing that. There's no problem yes. with connecting your connecting wallet. Connecting your wallet. Yes. Just connecting. Okay. So just connecting no your wallet. You, you, because you you're giving... Up. You're basically telling MetaMask, yes, tell this website what my wallet address is, no? But the, you're not actually signing anything. You're just saying, hey, yes, give him access to my wallet address. Oh, that's good. I mean, you do want to know who it is that you're going to be interfacing with, no? But the problem is, is when they ask you to sign something, no? So that's the next layer of, of, of let's say, security on the blockchain. So one is, it's public information. Anybody can see the contents of a wallet. That's no problem. I mean, and when you when you connect your your wallet to MetaMask or to a website, sorry, then you're just giving them kind of your wallet address. That's the only thing that you're giving. No, it's fine. No risk. It's there. fine. There's no risk. But when you're signing a transaction or when you're signing something, you're giving them your signature, <laughs> and that signature can then be used. No, and that's what happened with this phishing attack. And the problem is, is that when you are one falsely misleading people to thinking that this is completely decentralized. So you have to sign a transaction because this data is on chain. That's BS. It's not true. It's something that open source engineers did with purpose saying, oh yes. So instead of using email and password, we're just going to get them to sign something. Okay. Let's break that down for a minute. So basically now there's a difference between just connecting your MetaMask wallet to a website, no risk there. But now getting people familiar, people, everybody's familiar with, or everybody who's participating in, in um, crypto with MetaMask, you, you, tra you do transactions and you sign that when you're doing it, when you're sending a payment, when you're sending some Ethereum. And now there's this new, this new functionality where you can actually sign a transaction to log in. It's a login function. Instead of using your username and password, you can log in. But because everybody's so familiar with, or everybody participating is sending transactions, they can sort of get a little bit uh, complacent, let's say, with not not checking like, oh, what kind of transaction is this? And so you're saying it's un potentially, as we've just seen, an unnecessary, potentially risky step in asking everybody to now start logging in and registering with a MetaMask uh, transaction. It's not, only, it's not only unnecessary, it's dangerous because you don't want, you want people, those her, sorry, technology is built on top of mental models. And we, and it's, so it's like the toad that, you know, that gets boiled little by little. You don't realize how much you're being encroached by technology if you're not very careful in the way that you design things, you know? Mm. So by asking for everything to, for you to sign on, uh, that, that's just dangerous it's irresponsible so here's the thing looking at variables doing the same thing i just clicked on sign in sign yeah. in with metamask so these sites they don't have a username and password with an email address and a password they're, they're asking you to sign in with a metamask transaction why so why is it that web3 is so against uh, it's so new that they don't want to take in best practices is it all right so let's say that is the equivalent you want to remove friction from a service no you want to make it as seamless as possible and yes web3 allows you to do that but 
why do you need to sign a transaction if the, if the thing is not going to go on the blockchain? It's just ridiculous. I mean, Web3 needs to take some of Web2 and just make it so that, you know, we have an economic vehicle that we can work on on the web. And if the Web3, so, I mean, I'm kind of done with that. <laughs> I mean, this is a new internet, yes, but it doesn't mean it's the evolution of an internet now with crypto in it. No, and we have to take in the best practices from the old way of doing things and then just making them better now. Now, people are accustomed to passwords. I mean, the, 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 the problem is, is that from Web 2, that was when you really were able to kind of create your account and, and be able to participate and kind of publish something on the web. No, uh, they said, OK, we're going to remove friction. So now let's do social login. No? So now you could log in via Facebook or, and then Facebook was siphoning off all of our data. <laughs> yeah, you're saying, so let's pause there. This is another version of that. The login with using your Facebook or Google ID, that was again, because people were like, well, let's make it frictionless, like you're saying, and remove the username and password, one click. But like you said, those, those organizations, they knew everything about us, every site we were logging into. And now the Web3 version of this is, I'll just sign in with your MetaMask wallet, except this time, it could, but not always. It's what you're saying. It's more the habits. There's not necessarily something um, necessarily wrong with that. It's just that how sophisticated are people with this new, relatively new technology, where the transaction ID are they actually checking every little checkbox that that particular contract is asking? That's the trick here. Are you across? every function. And if they're a, a good website, like they've got reputable people, like let's say Rarible or OpenSea, they're not doing something malicious by asking you to log in like that. However, because of the habit, you're saying the habitual nature of humans, they get used to that. And now they'll just click on any website, use their MetaMask because it's a habit because we're all so busy, click, click, click. And before you know it, what have you done? You've, you've signed over potentially access to your keys, to your wallet, to, to, to who knows what, if some other site knows how habitually people, I mean, people are getting fished all the time. That was a phishing attack of a fake email from OpenSea that tricked people into losing millions of dollars worth of NFTs. Now, we the, the main point here is for everybody listening, just like wisen up, start learning how MetaMask works in more detail and really just pay attention to everything you're signing. Would you say that's the main takeaway? Yes, and, 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 and even for people that actually know Kind of I've learned it like my, like myself or yourself that we work with this technology. It's so difficult to actually know what it is that you're signing because it's just a wallet address, and so you would have to go to EtherScan, make sure that who's the owner. I mean, you can go down that rabbit hole, and <laughs> just I think overall, overall is try not to sign anything that is not needed. Obviously, if that's kind of what's already in the industry, just be very careful that you check the root of the website. So here you see rarible.com. You have to make sure that there's no other kind of subdomain there, no? Or it, it, that is that, that you're actually on the Rarible website, you know? So you have to look at the URL and you have to look that it's actually HTTPS and now almost all websites now are encrypted, but just make sure that I think that's the one thing that you need to look at if you are going to sign something. Now, the other is I think as, as, as users of these services, we need to be more vocal on saying, hey, F the illusion of you being Web3 and completely decentralized that you're asking me to sign a transaction when I'm logging into something. Give me password, email and password. Okay, and that's a good lead in. What are we doing with our new band NFTs marketplace, the music NFT marketplace? So, I mean, we actually had this discussion one, the, the same week before this hack happened, where we were thinking, all right, what are we going to do? Are we going to ask them to sign a transaction in order for them to log in? Or should we just go down email and password? <laughs> and, you know, it was a kind of the, a philosophical debate at first because this hack had, it hasn't happened, but I kind of saw it coming. So we said, okay, well, if we ask for people to connect their wallet, because, you know, they can connect their wallet, we know who they are, and that's okay. We're just getting public information. But... If we ask them to sign a transaction so and we can get a token that then I can use as an OAuth token in our, back, in our, in our back end, I believe that we're going to put them at risk. So we now decided that we're going to do it the old way and, and, and do it to 
benefit our users and uh, our collectors to protect them and just go the extra step of and and even and you don't even have to create your account so just by connecting your wallet you will be able to interface with the system but if you want to change your banner if you want to create your own avatar if you want to be more active in the community then you just have to create your email and password in that little gear that you see there on the uh, on the bottom no so there there you register email and password that's it and you're safe and you don't need to sign any transactions because we're not telling you that this is going to be stored on the blockchain. It's not. It's going to be stored in a central server <laughs> because I don't need to store, you know, your avatar and your name or whatever in in the in the blockchain. It's just ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense for us to do that. No. Totally. Now, in terms of an an anonymity, no. If you don't want to dox yourself, no, then you don't need to. I mean, you don't need to put in a name or uh, you don't need no. to do it. Actually, just here's leave. the thing with that. It's just, we, here's the benefit. Like we're going to protect you from having to ha do a sign on, on MetaMask on an extra transaction that you don't need to do on Ethereum. You're just going to click to connect your MetaMask wallet. Uh, so there's zero risk there. Actually, there would be zero risk anyway, but we're just removing as much complexity. We want to get you into the right habits. And so you just, if you want to, as Sergio was saying, you can just use a, an email address and a password. There's no name that you need to use at all. That could be any Gmail that you, or any email address that you spin up with whatever password. Proton and this is going to- mail if you that's want. That's it. And <laughs> we're going to offer that because if you want to connect up with your uh, various, with the artists that are, that are on board with the platform to get special offers, to get benefits from being connected to uh, to the larger community over on Band NFTs. And that's why we're doing that, but you don't even have to. Long and the short of it is, it's been a deep dive today, Sergio, into this. And- uh, Hopefully, everybody's learned some of the, the habits that they should be picking up on how to manage their MetaMask wallet. And we're very sorry, obviously, to everybody who's lost out over on OpenSea. Um, my, me and Sergio, we've also, even us with all our technical knowledge, we've been prone at times to hacks. It really sucks. I can tell you how lousy it feels. And it makes us all the more uh, the, getting the urgency of how this has to be done correctly. Because now we're responsible for building out a platform, taking care of you guys, giving you the insights into the way, the best ways for you to interact with the blockchain. And so, Sergio, it's been great having you today. Um, Thank you, Ronnie. Yeah, lots of amazing uh, expertise that you've shared for people. I'm sure people's heads are spinning like, whoa, but don't be scared, everybody. Uh, just actually probably go watch a few more videos on, on MetaMask functionality, or on how to take better care of your wallet. It, this stuff's important. So uh, it's been great having you with us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sergio. Thank you.